That's our speaker for this evening. Brother Bell. God, we come to you at this time. We're so thankful we have the opportunity to come out and to listen to your word. And we pray that what's brought to us will, will touch us and we can take it with us and, and uh, just be just be glorified by, the, by your word. We thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come here, that we all have good health. We know how it can be cut short quickly, and there's so many on our list that are, are needing your help as far as their health, and we pray that you'll be with each and every one of those. We pray that you'll be with each person here tonight, that our, uh, our worship here will be pleasing to you, and we just pray that when we do walk out those doors that our light shines. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. You want to follow along with some blue songbooks? I'm number seven. I'm 412. 412. Jesus, hold my hand. All three verses. <laughs> As I travel through this pilgrim, then there is a friend who walks with me. Leads me safely through the sea, getting said it is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer to go. He said to help me do the best I can. For I need my life to help me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need to get me high. Through this pilgrim land. By thy path, to him the evil deed, to dawn the gallant When I give in prayer, I hope to be to their blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Let me travel in the night, even that I may see the blessed rain. Give me that I may be holy, and it seems to be dim some song someday. I will be a soldier brave, and to an ever-burning take a stand. As I hopeward go, and daily meet the foe, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I did the head behind Through the spirit of hell Protect me by thy path To him my people plead Through Lord, the devil need When I did in prayer I hope to meet you there Blessed Jesus, hold my hand Dim to what the setting of the sun. Lead me safely to a land, the blessed fire come of life of one. I have put my faith in thee, dear, but that I may be the golden strand. There's no other friend on whom I can depend. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. I gave the head behind. Through the spirit of death, protect me by the path. To him, my people plead. Oh, Lord, look down on him. When I give in prayer, I hope to meet you there, blessed Jesus. Hold my hand. Amen. Song number 674. <coughs> 674. I have decided to follow Jesus. All four verses. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now? To follow Jesus, will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Amen. 876. 876 will be sung with invitation and encouragement. Tonight we are in, we are in for a treat in the man, in the man, Kevin Batten. This is our third, our second, sorry, uh, meeting in our series that we're calling Spiritual Boot Camp. Want to welcome those who are with us, those who have started off this journey with us, and we'll acknowledge our visitors more formally um, after, after the lesson tonight. But I'm here now to introduce um, not only a good gospel preacher, but but my friend, we, 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 go, we go way back. We started off uh, serving God together and doing all that we can uh, to help the kingdom of God. And you'll hear me say this every week about each one of these speakers. I know him. I know his heart. Um, he's married to Christina, and uh, they, have, they have three children. I didn't even need to write this down. Why did I even need to write this down? Um, they are active members at the Hillcrest Church. Kevin is the executive uh, producer and the co-founder of the Ripple of Light Ministries. And if you haven't had a chance to, to see what that ministry does, a videography ministry, um, Google it. Go to their website. They just do an outstanding, outstanding work. And uh, I'm, I'm asking all the preachers um, that are coming and speaking for us, what's your, what's your favorite scripture? And in true Kevin Batten, fashion he sent me one scripture then he changed it and said wait this month it's this particular uh, <laughs> scripture his his favorite scripture for the month for this month is John 19 30 and when Jesus had received the drink again being up on the cross Jesus said it is finished and with that John says he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit the man Kevin Batten that I know is a Christian man, a sound gospel preacher, um, would do anything for you, give you the shirt off of his back. But, but more than anything else, his heart is about ministry and preaching and serving the people in God's kingdom. Kevin, I'm glad you're here. Come on and, and preach the gospel. Kevin Batten. you know that I had sent you the the email and it was in a in a sense it was a remass it was a clue it was a hint saying I am finished I sent it to you I didn't want to spell it out but I was just it was just a little a little clue there but my, I, I would say uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God into salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So for this month, it changed to not John 19.30, but before that it was Romans 1, Romans 1.16. If you have your Bibles, turn, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. 
Ephesians chapter 6, we'll be spending some time in all of God's Word today, but the launching pad will, will take place from here, and I just want us to get a, a foundation of where we are starting and then where we will be going for tonight. Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, and I know this is for the theme of the spiritual boot camp, with the basic training for Christian service, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Paul writes, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to to speak. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for you, for your son, for your spirit, for your word, for your church, for our families, for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Father, tonight, pray that I'll be able to speak boldly the words of your, your book and that our hearts will be open and ready to receive this engrafted word, which is able to save our souls, which is able to mature us and to, to transform us into the image of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that the things said, those things that were supposed to be heard and, and kept, that they will be kept, those things that are not supposed to be heard and kept, that they will fall off, but that we can grow closer to you. We pray for this event, not only tonight, but this entire summer series that the church here at Trent, Church of Christ, will grow and be closer to you. Thank you for all that you bless us with. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I have two of my very best friends here tonight. I uh, didn't know if Ken was, was coming, but, but, but Ken Austin from Abilene and, and, and Freddie Famble. Freddie, I've known Freddie for a long time. In fact, I... I I do work behind the scenes for Facebook where we send messages all over the world. We've reached over 2 million people this year alone, but I'm not on there personally very often. But I did see where my wife posted uh, something where we just celebrated our 27 uh, years of marriage, and, and I saw Freddie Fambel commenting on that. So I've known Freddie for at least 27 years, at least 27 years. And there have been times that Freddie and Ken as well that has, uh, has sharpened me with iron, sharpens iron because they're very good friends and 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 you're blessed to have Freddie here at Trent moved to Trent at one time he was my elder and at another time I was his property manager so things uh, but we've always been friends and he's been he's been faithful every step of the way and I'm glad that he's put his hand behind the plow here at the Trent uh, Church of Christ in Trent Texas we read Ephesians chapter 6 you've studied Ephesians chapter 6 you know that Paul is writing, and, and so many times Paul uses an analogy of us as Christians being Christian soldiers. We, we know when he talks to Timothy being a good soldier, we know his friend Epaphroditus, he says, Epaphroditus is my fellow soldier. So, so we have this idea, this, this concept, we're, in a, we're, we're soldiers. When, when we put on Christ... Because there is a battle, and we become Christian soldiers. And we need to know how the battle operates as a soldier of Christ. And Ephesians chapter 6 simply lists 
some of the weapons that a soldier of Christ uses in warfare. We saw in Ephesians 6, 17, and Paul says, And take, and take the sword, take the sword of the Spirit. Yes, now, this past week, I did some extensive studying on the simple concept in the word sword. Yes. Just the word sword. And, and, and first of all, here, Paul is using this, and, and you, can, you, you know he's seeing a, a, a Roman soldier, because at this point in, in his uh, prison, being in a house, house prison, he, he's sitting there, and he, he, there's, there's Roman soldiers everywhere. And, and you see a sword on the Roman soldier, so you know that, that is in, in his mind. But knowing Paul, he goes back and he starts reflecting all the times that the Old Testament uses the word sword. It was a commonly used word in all of Scripture. In the Old Testament, the word sword is cherub. Cherub. And it means to desolate or to destroy. In the New Testament, in the Greek, we have the word makara. Makara. And, and, and that's a short sword, and the root word there is to war. Yes. We have another word for sword that's used in the New Testament, not as prominently, but it's still used several times, and that is the word humphraya. And I'm, I'm not saying that correctly, but it's humphra, and that is a long sword used in the New Testament as well. Yes. But what we do know throughout Scripture is that mighty men of God used the sword in battle to defend and conquer throughout biblical history. Yes. In the time of Moses, in Moses' writing in Leviticus chapter 26, 7 through 9, Moses writes, and, and this was a promise for those to obey God, and Moses writes, But you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. So I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will confirm my covenant with you. Yes. Now that's interesting. So five swords can... can, can uh, scare away an army of a hundred, and, and a hundred swords or a thousand swords can, can scare away ten thousand from a hundred. That's a mighty sword. Yes. In the time of David, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, 13, then David said to his men, Each of you, each of you strap on his sword. Yes. So each man strapped on his sword, and David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up behind David. So we have the time of Moses. We see mighty men carrying a sword. In the time of David, they were actually called the mighty men, and they strapped on their sword. Yes, After David with King Solomon, even Solomon had mighty men. And Solomon writes, The mighty men of Israel, all of them are wielders of the sword, expert in war. Each man has his sword at his side, guarding, guarding against the terrors of the night. Yes. We move on, and we have the major and the minor prophets. And in the time of Ezekiel, the sword is used 86 times. So, well, why in the world would Ezekiel use the sword 86 times? He's a prophet. What was going on? Well, and that's 20% of all of the times that the sword is used. Yes. So, the time of Ezekiel, Ezekiel writes, By the swords of the mighty ones, I will cause your multitude to fall. So, we see, when God is behind the sword, one sword can defeat many enemies. Yes. We're not done in, in the time of Nehemiah, and this is one of my favorite. Nehemiah, was, he was rebuilding the walls, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem because of the, of, of the disobedience that the children of Israel had, and now they're coming back, getting ready to come back, and it's time to rebuild the walls. Yes. But any time you do a good work for the Lord, there's going to be an enemy. Yes. And the enemies showed up, and Nehemiah looked at the individuals, and the individuals that were in his camp, they were terrified. Yes. They were full of fear. They didn't know what to do. So here are the words of Nehemiah. When I, Nehemiah, saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Yes, Nehemiah says to them, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight. And fight for your brothers. Yes, fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your houses. Men and women... If there's ever a time that we need to fight, when we look at the generation that comes below us, and we say, what has happened? We're losing entire generations 
I'm a Generation X. That that follows me is the millennial generation. Those that follow them is Gen Gen Z. And we look at over 50% of them are no longer even going to church. It's time to fight for our families, to pick up the sword and to fight. In verse 17, those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. As for the builders, each wore his sword girded at his side as he built while the trumpeter stood near. Yeah, he worked, but he always had his sword because the enemy was nearby and he he was not going to allow that enemy to sneak up on him. He was going to be ready and fight for his family, fight for his nation, fight for for, 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 for his wife and children. Even in the time of Jesus... Even in the time of Jesus, in Luke twenty two thirty six, 36, Jesus says, But now let him who has a purse take it along, also a bag, and let him who has no sword sell his robe and buy one. Yes, Jesus? Yes, dangerous times call for dangerous measures. This idea of putting on a sword is found throughout the history of the Bible. Between the sheaths, you, you know, several years ago, I bought a special Bible. I mean, there's nothing special about it, but, but I upgraded. I didn't tell my wife. I, I, I did an upgrade. And I did the genuine leather version. Now, it's the New American. I, I study from the New American Standard. I do that because it's the closest translation besides uh, that, that you're going to have. The ESV is getting pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty good. But word for word, the, the New American Standard is, 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 is the, the closest word for word translation that we have in the English. But, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what's at the very back of my Bible, and it's called genuine leather. Yes. And, and I love that. I, I've given some sermons on genuine leather. And I started thinking about how it can apply to this, this verse and how I can justify the expense of the genuine leather. I just put it in my sermon. The shield, or, or, or the sword, goes into a sheath, and that sheath was genuine leather. Yes, sir. So the idea of putting the sword in the genuine leather of your Bible, piercing through in Genesis and wielding itself throughout in the book of Revelation and every, almost every book in, in between. We see the word sword. Yes, we see the word sword 438 times. Now last week you may think I'm crazy, but I read every single scripture 438 times on this aspect of sword. The sword, what I found in Scripture, the sword is used to guard. The sword is used to protect. The sword is used to defend. The sword is also used, however, to attack. The sword is also used to destroy. The sword is also used to demolish against one's enemy. It is both defensive and offensive. The biblical phrase that identified a man as a soldier was that he drew the sword, 2 Kings 3, 26. The first time, this is interesting, the first time you see the mention of the word sword, Brother Fample, is not from a man. In Genesis 3, I know it's messing up there, in Genesis 3, 24, in Genesis 3, 24, (laughs) there was some cherubim. And the cherubim, had a flaming sword, and they were guarding the tree of life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the first time we see the word sword is used with the cherubim. Yes, sir. Now, the, 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 the last time, the last time, get your Bibles, turn, turn to John 19. The last time that we see the word sword, John 19, I'm going to read this, and, and beginning in verse number 11, and I'll let you get there. From Genesis to Revelation. Gen- Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. And he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. Yes, sir. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, yes. and, his, and his name is called the Word of God. Yes. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. 
and he treads the winepress and of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We go down to verse 20, And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped him his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Verse 21, last time we see the word sword, And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat upon the horse. So the first time we see the word sword is with the cherubim. The last time we see the word sword is with Jesus himself. And you could, you could reread this and place one of his, his titles and say, And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the word of God. Yes, so in Genesis 1 and 2, when, when God created the earth and everything in it, and everything was perfect, we had, we had uh, the Garden of Eden, we had the, the, the rivers running through it. We had the, 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 the beautiful aspect and no sin was in the world. And the tree of life was there in Genesis 1 and 2. Yes. And we don't see this kind of setting again until we get to Revelations chapter 21 and 22. It's a parallel and, and it's the beginning and the end. And in Revelations 21 and 22, we see almost the same thing. It's the new heaven and the new earth. It's paradise. And guess what's there? In, in Genesis, it has to end up, we had a, a, a guard guarding the tree of life with the swords. But in Revelation, we do not. We still have the tree of life in Revelation 21 and 22. But whoever so will can come and drink freely of the, of the living water that is there. And the Spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. And we grasp in Revelation that the word of God is victorious over the enemies of God's people. So the battle, the battle in this leather sheath, from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through Revelation chapter 20, the battle is taking place. And in this battle, you better be prepared. We better make sure we have put on the full armor of God. And it has been established that the sword is a necessary tool for battle. But this battle... This battle is not a fleshly battle that we face today. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, wickedness in the heavenly places. We, we, we look at Ephesians 6, 17. It says, the, the, the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. See, see, an earthly sword will no longer suffice to withstand in the Empyrean realm. In the heavenly realm, an earthly sword will no longer protect us. That's, That's why the Bible says, take up the sword of the Spirit, to pneumatos. Now, this, this, the, 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 the context and the, the structure of how Paul writes this is very interesting. It's two nematos, and, and if you read it in one way, it's the genitive, it's the of the spirit, the genitive of origin. If we look at it through those, that lens, it is a sword given by the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. But others have come along and said, you can read it that way, and there's nothing wrong with reading it that way, but you can also, the way the structure in the Greek is written, you could also read it as an adjective sense. And if you read it that way, it is a spiritual sword. So it's the sword of the Spirit, but it also could be read as the spiritual sword. And I'll say yes. Yes, sir. yes and yes. It is a spiritual weapon given to us by the Holy Spirit. A Spirit-given spiritual sword. Yes, sir. You following me? Yes, sir. A Spirit-given spiritual sword. It is not a sword of man. Man did not he, he was man did not originate this sword. In in Isaiah 31, 4 and 8, the great prophet Isaiah says, For thus saith the Lord to Isaiah, and the Assyrian will fall by a sword not of man, and a sword not of man will devour him. It is what is it? It is a sword of the Lord, the sword of Jehovah. Jeremiah, the great prophet, in Jeremiah 47, 6, when God was telling him, prophesy against the Philistines. And the Philistines, this is their response throughout the prophecy. And they say, oh, 
Sword of the Lord, how long will you not be quiet? Withdraw into your sheath. Be at rest and stay still. In the response, through Jeremiah's writing, God says, How can it be quiet when the Lord has given it an order? 2 Corinthians 10.4, as mentioned earlier, For the weapons, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. In, f- in fact, this is, Brother Family, this is so, so good. It's like, uh, we're going to go back, we're going to go back 20 years. It's like Maxwell coffee. It's, it's good to the last drop. Let, 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 let's go, let, let's go to uh, 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 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And Brother Austin, do you have that beginning? We're not going to start in verse number 4. We're going to start in verse number 1. Because we want to know how to fight in this spiritual, in this spiritual arena. And sometimes you think you're fighting against flesh and blood, but there's something that you don't see. There's something that you don't understand. There is something that we have to walk by faith and, and say, I'm not, I'm not upset with you. There's something else going on. And I, I'm not going to use my, my physical guns. I'm going to use a sword that is more powerful than anything that was ever created or could be created by man on earth. On, and and, and we're, we're, you better watch out because you don't know. You think the atomic bomb is bad? On, no. Man. This sword is the sword of the Spirit. Uh-huh. It's, the, it's the sword of the Lord. Go, it's a spiritual sword. So, so I have at my disposal... Yes, sir. One of the most powerful weapons for the Word of God is living and active. Another way, for the Word of God is quick and powerful, the King James says. And you want something powerful, this is a powerful sword. But, but I'm not going to have, Paul said, I'm not going to get it out quite yet. I, I, I'm gonna, this is how you, you operate in the spiritual realm. But because you're not ready for the sword yet, I, we're, we're just going to talk. As, 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 as brother to brother. And in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse number 1, what does the Bible say? I, Paul. I, Paul. Okay, I, I'm, I'm entreating you. And he's, he's talking to these, these uh, false brethren yes, that were accusing him of not being a true uh, apostle. And, he, and Paul is needing to defend himself because he, in him defending himself with the apostolic authority that God gave him, he is, he is writing these things down for us and also where we know how to operate. That's good. That's so good. I urge you, keep reading, Ken. I entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Oh, you didn't pull the sword out yet? How did, what did he say? Read that again. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I entreat you, brothers. Man, you've been after me. But I, I, I entreat you by the meekness yes, sir. and the gentleness of Jesus Christ. That's good. You don't come at somebody and just bang them over the head because they're not listening to you. Come on, come on, you entreat with them with the gentleness Preacher. and the meekness yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, and the sir. kindness. Yes, sir. Oh, you, don't under, you don't understand that? Let, let, can we have a cup of coffee? Yeah. And we, can, we, can we talk? Yes, yes, yes. Can, we, can, we, can we sit down? You know, you, you, you said that you, you, you said homosexuality was okay because you know somebody. That, can, we, can we talk uh-huh. and see what, see what the Bible says? Are, are you okay with just talking? Yes, sir. Yes, I, I, I'm gonna, I, this is meekness. You know, you don't need to be telling everybody else what you think because I, I, want, I want the Word of God to speak. And, and these are not my opinions. I just want, I want the Word of God to, 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 to stand alone. And, and can we talk? So, so Paul is entreating them with meekness and gentleness. Keep reading. I am humble. Ah, so they were, they were accusing him of not being humble. Keep reading. But bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Yeah, I, you know, you, you've accused me of walking in the flesh, in the sinful flesh. Yes, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I want to entreat you. I, I want to talk to you, brother. I know you're being, I, but I'm going to be a little sarcastic here. But, but let's, let's get along, because if we can't get along, I want to write this, if we can't get along, the big guns are coming out. Yes, Keep reading, Ken. For although we walk in the flesh. For although we walk in the flesh. See, turn it on. So even though we walk as human beings, every one of us. Yes, sir. We are not waiting. 
Keep reading. We're not waging war according okay. to the flesh. Okay, even though we're walking as human beings, the war that we're going to fight is not like human beings fight. Let's go, Captain. Let's go, Captain. Keep reading. For the weapons of our warfare. Oh, here it comes. For the weapons of our warfare. Not of the flesh. They're not of the flesh. They're yeah. not. We, we just talked about that. Mm -hmm. They're not. You can't create. This is not a fleshly battle. Let's go, and you can't fight a non-fleshly battle with fleshly warfare. Uh -huh. Keep reading. But have divine power. But have divine power. To destroy strongholds. To destroy strongholds. We destroy our Up, 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 up. There we go. To destroy strongholds. So the, the, the weapon that we have is powerful enough to destroy strongholds. An another translation says it destroys fortresses. Same thing. Now, a stronghold is a fortress... With one weapon, this is what it's used for. Now, now, what is, in the biblical sense, a stronghold or a fortress? Paul tells us as we move to verse number 5. Keep reading. We destroy arguments. Here we go. So this is what the stronghold or the That's fortresses the are. Yes, sir. We destroy arguments yeah. and, and every... And Okay? We destroy arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we make obedient every, every thought to Christ. So these strongholds, these fortresses that are there, are in some translations say they're imaginations, they're arguments, they're speculations, and these arguments, imaginations, speculations, they're the ones that are contrary on, Kevin, to the Word of God. Uh -huh. we're, 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 now we're dealing with spiritual battle. Now, now we're dealing with spiritual warfare. The greatest battle that we have in front of us is not, I don't like my brother, it's the battle of truth and error. Yes, sir. And the great deceiver in Revelation chapter 7, his attempt and his purpose is to deceive the entire world. That's good. So what our battle is, we better be prepared with our spiritual armor. Destroying every speculation and imagination and everything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and, and bringing it into captivity. You know, the, 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 these fortresses, these strongholds are, are simply faulty values, faulty beliefs, false religions, prisons in people's lives. The warfare that we are at is a demonically inspired system. Yes, sir. It's the doctrines of demons. Yes. Satan is the prince of this world, and we are assaulted by the system around us. Yes, sir. There are systems that we have bought into, uh -huh. every one of us, on, that did not come from God. Come on, and the truth will set you free, but you've got to know what is truth. Paul had asked a question to Jesus, what is truth? Paul is warring, he is strategizing, using the sword of the Spirit for the destruction of strongholds. Because if you don't, if you stay in that stronghold, one's fortress ultimately, ultimately becomes one's tomb. Amen. Fortresses Amen. themselves are not demons. We're not fighting demons. They come from the doctrine of demons, the teaching of demons, and the seducing spirits. And people can be telling that, but the ultimate, what's behind that are the seducing spirits and the doctrines, the teachings of demons. Paul, because sometimes he goes low, sometimes he goes high. And in 1 Corinthians 3.20, Paul, quoting scripture, equates the reasonings of the wise. You say, oh, you mean in the academia world? Yeah, the reasonings of the wise as a stronghold. In other words, anyone or anything... Those who have turned against the true God and fortified themselves in their own false systems. Yes, sir. Yes. I, I love what Paul does in Romans 4, 3, and then throughout he answers it. He, when we, when we're, we have questions, yes, we don't answer the question immediately. We, we answer the question with another question, and here's the question what Paul says. What does the Scripture say? What does the scripture say to answer this question? When it's dealing with a system, and I don't know which system we could, there's thousands of them. 
and in, in the society that we live today, you can turn on, you go to YouTube, or, there's 120 genders, really? What does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? Oh, homosexuality is not a sin? What does the scripture say? Oh, you can hate your brother, you can, you can, you can fight in, in unfair... What does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? That's Paul's response to these strongholds. So it has been implied and now explicitly stated, the sword, the sword of which we are told to use and be equipped with, is a divine sword. It is a spiritual sword. It is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So being able to wield the sword is being able to use the truth of Scripture at any given point. Yes, sir. Since Ken's here, I'm going I'm to share a story. And if I get it wrong, you can correct me afterwards. No, you can, you can correct me. <laughs> This was about five years ago, and I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know. I, I just, sometimes when people call and they need some Bible help, I'm, I'm, I'm quick to, to be there. Amen. And another partner in crime with me, he doesn't even know what he gets himself into like half the time, is my brother Ken. I always say, Ken, we got to go, and he's there. And, and I got stories that would take us all into the night. I can't, we can't share all of the some of those stories right now. But here's just one. Here's one. So, Ken, we, there's something going on. I don't know what it is, but there's a brother, and these crazy people are trying to get him to sell their, his house and all of his, all of his stuff, and then go join some cult somewhere. I don't know anything about it. Let's, let's, can, can you come? And, and we, need to, we need to deal with these people. So we went there, and I didn't know anything about it, but they're, they're called the Church of Wells. You can Google it. Not now. When you get home... Church of Wells, they've been on Dateline and Nightline and Dr. Phil and Texas Monthly and all this stuff because they're crazy. But they're well-versed in their little narrative of what they use. Well, there was a guy there, and they were trying to go after this guy to get him to sell everything he had and move to Wells, Texas. And, and there so, they, were, they were three or four of them, and we were sitting there, and the, we invited them to my office. So we were there, and we were there for six hours. Six hours. And one thing led to another, and, you know, we were tracking at one point, and it was just getting, it was getting old. And they, were, they would not move. And, and, and it's interesting, the one thing that moved them, because I finally said, this, nothing's working. I don't have the right, you know, rima. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word. That word, word there in the, in the Greek is not the logos, it's the rhema. Every word, every, and that word is a short utterance, it's a statement to, uh, to, 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 to defeat a, a, something that was said. So, for some reason, I, I was praying and I said, you, your elders, how old are your elders? Now, this is after six hours. Oh, our elders, yeah, we obey our elders. They're, tw they're like in their 20s, like 25. I said, oh, okay, this is going to be easy. This is going to be easy. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> in, in, the, in the Greek and in the, in the Hebrew, the word elder, you know what the word elder means? Elder is older. <laughs> That's an easy one. No, 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 you can't. Well, we had to go back and I had to show them, okay, this is the, the, the time of service, and then after this in the book of Leviticus, after this mount, and then they become elders. They didn't want to hear any of that. We're not in the Old Testament anymore. Okay, okay oh, we're in the New Testament. Okay, let's... Well, there are qualifications for elders. All right, let's go. You got children? Yeah, our elders got children. The baby was born last week. <laughs> Took them over to Scripture, showed them a qualification of elders. At that point, they turned. Oh, okay. They turned and they looked at me and they said, You are of the devil. <laughs> you are of the devil. Lord, I'm a nice guy. But I can, uh, if Ken's with me, <laughs> and this is not the first time, this is not the first time, I can say, if Ken's, because he has some guns, I mean, he has some swords in his arm, you know, you just, if Ken's with me, I, 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 I kind of rise up a little bit, and he's calling me the devil, he said, you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're the devil. I looked at them and said, look guys, you've been here for six hours, you've been drinking my water. You've been eating my food. 
You've been breathing the air that I pay the electricity on. You're not answering the question about the elders. Get out of my office. <laughs> Ken and James, they're saying, what, what? <laughs> they got out. They got out. But the man that was there, his eyes were open. He did not follow them. The next day, they went to somebody else. The girl was going to ACU. She quit going to ACU. She sold everything she had. She moved to Wells, Texas. We weren't there. We must be prepared to fight the battles that are in front of us. False religious cults are all around. They want to use the word to snatch someone from it. And we've got to protect that. You know, the best example that we have in all of Scripture... It's not the example that I just gave. It's a biblical example. It's the example of Christ. And we know that in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, and Christ went, he was being tempted of the devil. And Christ goes into the wilderness. And in 4 1, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was sure enough hungry. I, I added that part just to understanding. And the tempter came and said to him, if, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written. It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yes, it is written. That word written, grapho, in strong concordance, is, 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 is one word. It's, it's, it's graf, grapho, in, in strong's is 1125. And in the Gospels, it's used 43 times just in the Gospels. Jesus says it out of the Gospels 30 of those 43 times. Yes. And he says, it is written. What does he say next? It is written. Man. It is written. Man. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. So the word is for man. And Jesus, as a man, was showing us the way. He was showing... Jesus... I don't know if you understand this right here. Because, yeah, Je if Jesus could have said, Satan, I am, I am God, <laughs> you are destroyed. Yeah, yeah, he would have been destroyed. But that would not have been an example for man. Now, now, now if, use a boxing analogy. Right? Maybe you get this. Let's say I confront, or I wouldn't confront, I wouldn't, that's not that stupid. But let's say I get into an altercation with this guy named Mike Tyson. Okay? You know, the boxer. Yeah. If I got beat up, or like knocked out or dead, by Mike Tyson, it would be understandable because I'm not a boxer. But if I got beat up by Pee Wee Herman, I wouldn't show my face around for a while. It's one thing for God to act out of his divinity. But when he was at, and Satan wanted him to do that. Because it underscores and undercuts so much else. When, 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 it, when, it, when he acted, when he put his divinity on a shelf. And he acted out of his humanity. And he says, it is written, man. Man shall not live by bread. You told me I could preach today. Okay? You told me to go old school and come back. I don't want to be out there. I don't want them looking at me funny. Man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus was showing man the way on how to handle spiritual warfare. Is it any wonder why the devil hates the Bible? And has done everything he can to twist it and deconstruct it and devour it and ridicule it. Because the Bible for man is his life force. Yes, As a man, Jesus conquered the enemy by the words we have before us today. That's good, 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and the discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. Yes. We have aspects of this sword, one of them being it is a double-edged sword. Yes, it cuts you coming and it cuts you going. Yes, yes, it, 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 it's in season and it's out of season. It can reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It is the most powerful any way you slice it. Because if he cuts this way, it's going to cut you. If he cuts this way, it's going to cut you. And the Roman Claudius sword, which is about that long and used for over 600 years, maybe that's what he had in mind. And it was a double-edged sword and could get you any way as, as a Roman soldier. So it's a double-edged sword. But, but there are other aspects of the sword. When a soldier is out in battle, he doesn't take all of his makeup kits and stuff. He may want to look to see what he looks like, see what cuts he has on his face, though. And there are many movies, and there are times that you, they use the sword if it's polished, and the sword can be reflective and serve as a mirror. So, so the, the, the aspect of the blade aspect of the sword, if polished, can be used as a mirror. Yes, sir. In Ezekiel 21, in the parable of the sword, Ezekiel says, A sword, a sword, sharpened and also polished. Sharpened and also polished. There are portions of the sword that reflect the law. And the law is there to serve as a mirror which shows mankind's inability to measure up. Yes, we could go all into Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 3. If you don't want Paul's writing, we can go all into Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 7 with the Sermon on the Mount. And what we see when we, we don't measure up. We cannot measure, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom. Well, I can't get there. You're right. You can't. You can't measure up. And that portion of the law that serves as the mirror says, I am guilty, Lord. I can judge them. Look at how bad they are, but I look at my own self. In one aspect, if you break one aspect of the law, you've broken the whole law. That's another lesson for another time. But this mirror, and, and what does a mirror do? It highlights man's sinfulness. So this portion of the sword on the blade, the polished part, serves as a mirror which shows that you have a dirty face. And the purpose of the mirror, therefore, is to drive you to the water. If you have a dirty face, you need to go get cleaned up. You need to go to the water. And that's how you measure up. Now we have the double-edged aspect of the sword. We have the blade aspect of the sword. We also have the handle. And it's a handle that we should never let go of. You hold on to it every waking hour. Yes, sir. Now one of David's mighty men, his name was Eleazar. Yes, and in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 10, Eleazar, one of the three mighty men, he wasn't just the mighty man, he was one of the three mighty men. Yes, sir. With David, he arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary, and the Bible says he clung. Yes. He clung to the sword. Yes. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Another translation, and all like this, it says, Eleazar never let go of his sword. Yeah, that's right. Another translation says it this way, his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. Yeah. So what has happened with Eleazar, one of the reasons he was a mighty man of, of David, mighty man of God, is because the sword acted as an extension of himself. When he had the sword in his arm that he never let go of, you didn't know if it was his hand or his sword because it all was one. It was one. Need some water. The example we find in Jesus being one with the Word is in itself phenomenal. He never let go of his sword. He and the sword are one. John 1.1 1, 1. The Word and Jesus are synonymous. The Word of God is Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus is the Word of God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Yes, sir. When Jesus was a baby, when he was a baby... Now, now, later on he says, how do you, how do you read this? We're asking the rich young ruler, how do you read the law and the scriptures? Well, this is how I read this, okay? When Jesus was a baby, in the point of chronology, when he was created into the world, in this point of chronology, the first time Jesus says anything about the Bible was, was when he was a baby. I said, what? He was having a conversation with God the Father on the day he was born into the world, his spirit was. 
We may miss it because the translators, <laughs> when you read in Hebrews chapter 10, the translators don't put it in red. It's still just in the black and white. The red ink is there, but his words are still there. Yes, sir. As a baby, supernaturally born through the immaculate conception, through the birth channels of the Virgin Mary, baby Jesus never ceased to being one with his father and had a dialogue with the father recorded by the Holy Spirit. Yes, Hebrews chapter 10 I begin reading in verse number 7, because the Hebrew writer says this, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's the context. Therefore, when he, he who, when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes into the world, Jesus says, Jesus says, Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. And whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said... This is Jesus talking. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the roll of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Mm, mm, mm. When this day came, there was a cry from the baby, not understood by the earthly ears, but which Jesus' father heard and the Holy Spirit preserved for the record. What does Jesus do? He points to the scriptures. He points to himself. In the scriptures. So as a baby, he's pointing to the scriptures. And when he is about to die, he is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And what does he do? He points to the scriptures. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he was betraying him who gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I shall kiss, he is the one who sees him. And immediately he went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have, have come to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. You know, he didn't tell him to throw away the sword. He said, he said, put it back in its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then, how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen this way? How? At that time, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. When it comes to scripture, when I say scripture, the very word scripture, grafe, now, Graf A is 11.24 in Strong's. It is written as 11.25 in Strong's. It is written as Graf O. Scripture is Graf A. And Scripture, Graf A, usually precedes the Graf O. But when it comes to the very word Graf A, Scripture, in the Gospels, it's used 20 times. Jesus uses it 10 times. Yet connected to his fulfilling of the Scripture, is used eight times, 80% of the time Jesus uses the word scripture, it's in context with him fulfilling. Ken gave me this, it's with him following his script. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He had a script and he was following it to the T. Scripture with his script, in other words, his fulfillment, his obedience to the scripture. Yes, and in order to follow in his steps, we have responsibility of our own to follow our script. Yes, to follow our script, shown forth to us in the Scripture. Scripture is a witness when it comes to Jesus, stating that this is the person he is claiming to be. Yes, what is written confirms Jesus' identity and calls our attention to it through prof prophetic fulfillment in order that we might believe yes, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In closing, Jesus' expectation concerning Scripture... What I'm going to do next is just go over 
some scripture, and I'm going to use the times that Jesus used scripture, and I'm going to go in chronological order, and this may help us, because I don't have another hour. I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to break this down quick. This will help us on what do we need to do when it comes to the word of God in scripture. So in, in order of Jesus' own words from the Gospels regarding the very word scripture, number one, read it. It starts there. Number one, read it. Matthew 21, 42, first time he uses the word scripture, Jesus says, did you never read in the scriptures? Did you never read in the scriptures? First time he uses it. Paul says in Ephesians 3, 4, when you read, you'll understand the mystery of the gospel of Christ. Number one, read it. Number two, understand it. You read it and then go back and try to understand it. Jesus says, New American Standard anyway, you're mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures, Matthew 22, 29. So when you read it, you need to spend some time every day reading the Scripture. You need to spend some time every day understanding the Scripture. Not understanding the Scriptures can lead into the wrong, 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 wrong light. Number three, you contemplate the Scripture. He says in Matthew 26, 54 that we read, How then shall the Scripture be fulfilled? It's the how then. So the how then, when we read Scripture, contemplate, meditate. What does this mean? Amen. How does this apply? Yes, what do I do? What Contemplate on, on, on Scripture. Yes, sir. But we also must examine Scripture. In, 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 in Matthew chapter, uh, in, in Acts, no, in Matthew 26, 56, this has taken place that the Scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Well, we need to examine that. Okay, just because you say it is in the prophets, let's go look. In Acts chapter 17, verse number 11, those in, those, those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they examined, they examined the Scriptures daily to see if those things which were spoken by Paul were true. We need to spend some time not only reading it and understanding it, contemplating it, examining it. And this is important. In, in, in Luke 4, 21... Jesus says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled. He gets up in, in the synagogue and he reads it. And today, this scripture has been fulfilled. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was acting upon scripture. Yes, sir. We must act upon it. Just because you hear the scripture and you don't act on it, that's like faith without works. It's, it's dead. So we act upon it. John 5, 39. Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is, the, it is of those that bear witness of me. You can read, and I, know, I know biblical scholars that don't have any faith. That's right. They do not believe the word of God. So you, you must mix, correlate scripture with Jesus Christ. Yes. Because all the scripture points, the old and the new, point to Jesus. So correlate, and ultimately, ultimately we must believe them. He who, John 7, 38, and this is in the exact order that we read through the Gospels. When it comes to Jesus' word in Scripture, He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living waters. He who believes in me. Yes. We must believe the Scripture. We read it, we understand it, we contemplate it, we examine it, we act upon it, we correlate them to Christ, and we believe them. Yes. I taught a lesson a, a, a few weeks ago on, just on Scripture. It was a Bible class. There was an 80-year-old man. His name is Bill. And Bill came up to me after class, and he, he said, Kevin, three years ago it was really the first time I started reading and studying the Scripture. I'm 80 years old. I just started three years ago. Now, I, I grew up in the church. I grew up in the church. And, yeah, I had a Bible, and I would, you know, look at it sometimes. I'd bring it to church. It even had my name on it. It was even a genuine leather Bible. <laughs> but for 77 years of my life, I didn't spend much time in it, reading it. I was a faithful attendee, but even though my Bible had my name on it, it, it was never read. I, I didn't have a clue, he said, on how to use this sword. D didn't know. And he, shared, he, he, he said, but now, he's 80 years old. 80 years old is never too large to stay. 80 years old, he said, you couldn't give me a million dollars to take this away from me. It has changed my life. Just the reading and the understanding and the contemplating and the examining and then acting and correlating and the believing has changed my life. That's the first closing. Because I don't know who's in here that needs to hear the second closing. 
And the Word of God is like a double-edged sword. We got one side of the sword, but I got to get it out on the other side. So the second closing, that closing was just for the one side and the closing now with the other. Church, we are to put on the full armor of God. We're to put it on. I, I read it in the beginning. Number one, we put on the belt of truth. Well, do you know that the whole armor of God is a picture of Jesus? We put on the belt of truth. Jesus says, John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth. Jesus is the truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. You know that the breastplate of righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Number three, we put on and put our feet shod with the gospel of peace because the gospel of peace is Christ's peace. Yes, sir. In Ephesians 2.14, for he himself is our peace. Yes, the shield of faith that we use is because of the faithfulness of Christ. It was his faithful obedience that took him to the cross to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The helmet of salvation is the salvation of Christ in his mind. Yes. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Yes. And the sword, <laughs> and the sword of the Spirit is. is the Word of God. Yes. In John 1, 14, and the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yes. When we put on the full armor of God, we are putting on Jesus Christ. Good. We are putting on Jesus Christ. In James 1, 21, in all humility, receive the implanted Word which is able to save our souls. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Yes, so how do we put it on? I've heard, how do we put it on? How do I have this protection? Paul writes in Galatians 3, 27, For as many as you have been baptized into Christ, yes, sir. have put on Christ. That's, good, That's the sword of the Spirit. You've heard it. Has the, has, the, has, has the sword cut you? Have you put on extra armor? You don't want to be cut by the sword? Have you looked at the sword? Because there's going to come a day that every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of God and will answer out of the book that have been written, we have and will be held accountable. And the question is, have we obeyed it? Have we done what he wanted us to do? Have we put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Hearing the word, believing it, acting upon it through the faithful, obedience, act of baptism. Yes, sir. We have that opportunity. Or maybe we just need to start reading our Bible and being more equipped with the sword of the Lord. And I don't care how old you are. Listen, you can't read that well. Well, the technology that we have today, get it on video. Get it on, give it, get it on, uh, spend some time in the Word. There's more than one way to do that. Yes, sir. Spend time with your sword. Because sword takes some practice and you need, to, you need to spend time. We need to spend time with the sword. Amen. I don't know how to end this out. Uh, we didn't talk about that. So that was the invitation. If you need to come to Christ, you need to repent of your sins. If you need to go into the watery grave of baptism, I don't even know if there's water back there, but we can find some water. We We've had to walk five miles before in Africa to find some water. The water is too free. We can find some water. Yes. Because that's the obedience of Christ when he tells us to be baptized for the remission of our sins and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we have that opportunity today to confess our sins and, and, and be faithful in the cross and to death. And we have that opportunity because of what Christ has done for us as we together stand and sing. Are we going to have a song? As we stand and sing, words of encouragement. I
I tried to tell you. <laughs> I, I tried to tell you. I, J Jimmy, again, you gonna have to get me a pair of gloves, uh, something to protect my hand. I, I try. I tried to tell you. I, these preachers didn't. Kevin do an outstanding job. Let's give Let's give Kevin a round of applause. <laughs> Linda Stevens has back issues. Not sure exactly what those particular issues. Um, are as of yet, and then um, Harry gave me this, and then Sandra Stevens um, is going to be having uh, minor uh, surgery. He's asking us to pray for Linda Stevens and to pray for Sandra Stevens. Ernest, I'm going to ask you to lead us in a closing prayer. I'll leave this card up here if we can, uh, if we can call them by name and, uh, and, and prayer and ask any prayer for them. Any other prayer requests that need to be made? Perhaps people didn't feel comfortable coming forward, but any other prayer requests that need to, need to be made. Thank you for those who are visiting with us, either in person or you're enjoying our uh, live stream. Uh, we're just so thankful that you are here tonight. Are there any first-time visitors that, that, that visiting for the first time? Um, we have a gift we normally want to, want to give you. I want to ignore anybody and then tonight we also want to give uh, Kevin a gift we want to we want him to know that on behalf of the church here in Trent there it is Kevin come on because if I take it if I take it I'm gonna take it home and and you know it's gonna be a problem uh, well we want you to know we appreciate you coming thank you for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ Chris and, and, and somebody get a picture Chris uh, Cindy somebody get a picture Please, I don't, I don't have my phone up here. Somebody take a picture and just get that to me and, and just send that, send that to me. And I know everybody want to know, y'all nosy. What's in, brother, what's in the bag? I want to see what he got. None your business. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We, we gave him one of the hats that we have with our logo, uh, Trent Church of Christ, MIA, Ministry in Action. And then there's a keychain also in there. Um, we just want you to know that we appreciate y'all coming so very, very much. Thank you for everything and for the preaching of the gospel. Next week, next week, we'll go into workshop mode. Um, there will be some preaching, but next week we'll go into workshop mode. James Sanderson is going to be coming um, from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie. Now, the meeting next week will start the 13th, the 14th, and he'll end on Wednesday, which will be the 15th. So we'll have a meeting on Monday, Tuesday, and then he will end 
on Wednesday. James is going to, Brother Sanderson is going to bring us some information in workshop format about soul winning and about reaching out and giving us some tips as to what he has um, done when we were at Baker Heights together as well as what he has done in the uh, church at Brown Street. Um, and he's, he's having as many as five Bible studies and baptisms every week, and he's been doing that consistently. And I wanted him to come and share the information with us. So next week we'll start on the 13th, 14th, and the 15th, and that will be three days of our workshop. It will conclude on that Wednesday. So 7 o'clock Monday, 7 o'clock Tuesday, and 7 o'clock on Wednesday and we'll host Brother James Sanderson. Also this Sunday, we will host two of the preachers from the Odom Lane Church of Christ preaching camp, and these young men are ready to go. They are excited, and these are actually two physical brothers as well as um, brothers in Christ, John Paul Cardenas and then Mark Anthony Cardenas, they are the brothers, and they will be preaching the gospel this Sunday, and I believe we'll also have a fellowship meal after that. Ladies, is there anything we need to say about the fellowship meal? Everything's good? Come, bring your appetite, and I will, I will have the two young preachers with me. We'll be first in line. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But we will host them. Um, again, it's the responsibility of the local church to train preachers, not colleges and universities. Okay, I'm going to get in trouble here. I'm going to go home with y'all, okay? But I've said it before, and it's still biblical, okay? We are the ones. Get your education. Go to Bible college. Go. But the training aspect for preachers, biblically, comes as a result of the local church. And so we uh, will host those preachers, and they're looking forward. They're scared because they've never preached before, but we're going to smile, and we're going to say amen, and we're going to encourage them, and then we're going to feed them good uh, afterwards, and so we're going to have an outstanding, an outstanding time. Before we have our, our closing song, um, after service, we dismiss. I believe in the back there is some drinks and some refreshment. We're inviting people to come back and spend a few minutes with us and, and fellowship with us. Let us get to know you um, a little bit a little bit better. Thank you for coming. Those who are visiting with us, set your schedules. Please come and, uh, and be with us again through the workshop. Just thank you for everything that you've done in helping make this, this series of meetings, making them a success. Brothers, have I overlooked anything? Any announcements? Anything that we need to make? Any, any announcements? Let's stand, please, and Richard will lead us in a closing song, and then Ernest, if you'll lead us in a closing prayer. Seventy-five. Cause that's not. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the right one, but it don't start out like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Nine seventy-five. Do, do what you can. <laughs> do, do what you can. I know it's getting late, people, but uh, after what this brother laid down, I got to go have me a sandwich. So, you know, we got we got lunch meat and bread back here, so please join us and, and have a sandwich afterwards. That's some closing prayer. Somebody's calling my name. Oh, somebody's calling my name. Somebody's calling who? Somebody's calling who? Somebody's calling my name. I'm going home on the morning train. Well, I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home. Well, I'm going home. I'm going home on the morning train. Evening train might be too late. Well, the evening train might be too late. Evening train, well, the evening train. Evening train might be too late. That back train and get you through. Come on in that back train and get you through. Back back train, you get a back back train. Come on in back back train and get your love. Get right to
pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, Father. You've given us life through your Son, Father. The death and the burial, the resurrection, Father. Your grace and mercy, Father. We're, we're not worthy, Father. We're, we're sinners, Father. But because your love is greater than our sin, Father, you sent your Son to die for us. And because of that, we're, we're grateful, Father. And let us, let us not take that for granted, Father. In, in times of weakness, help us to, to turn to you, to help us to pray for you, and help us to encourage one another, Father. And Father, as we gather this evening, we, uh, we're grateful that Kevin came our direction to preach your word, and we continue to pray for, uh, we're grateful that Eric had came as well, but we pray for James and his preparation, and pray for the young boys um, as they get ready to, to begin their stages of, of preaching your word, Father, that, that the men that are guiding them would, uh, would, would guide them in a way of truth and, in the way you would see fit, Father. And we just ask that you bless them uh, in, in their studies, Father, and help them to have a, a deep and sincere love uh, for your word, Father, as they get ready to preach this, this Lord's Day, if it be your will. Father, there are people to pray for. Uh, we offer our prayers for Linda Stevens and Sandra Stevens. You know their issues, Father. You know what needs to be done, Father. And, and just during this time, we just... We pray for spiritual healing at this time. We really realize we won't be in this earth forever, Father. But use these times to help us to, to lean on you, to put our faith and trust. And Father, that, that word faith is just, just amazing that uh, we would see it in, in the past, that we, w we, would see, uh, we would see men like Noah just building an ark and just not knowing what was going to take place. But his faith guided him during this time, Father. Father, I do want to just say thank you for the brothers and sisters that, that came our, in Christ, that came our direction. Uh, we're grateful that, that they're here to experience this, uh, this series, and, and we just ask, them, ask that you bless them in, in, their, in their ways as they get ready to leave this evening. And Father, I, I always remember the uh, Doug Tackett, and I remember you know, his, his ministry out there in uh, India. Just bless the pre preachers out there, and bless their their gospel meetings, Father. The, it's just amazing what you've done for us, and we're grateful for the full armor of God. Thank you for saving us through your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 